Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Our character today is the ultimate bookworm, intellectual, and scholar. You know, an uber nerd. This wizard takes study and homework to the highest level possible. Not even death can stop their cerebral pursuits. This wizard carries their obsession with arcana and other cognitive studies further than my obsession with D&D, so high bar. But our egghead isn't just the penultimate academic. They are also a fearsome opponent in combat, a nerd of prey if you will. Though we won't just be thinking about combat, we're going to try to make a well-rounded character. So, in my last three videos, I've been analyzing the feature of the Order of Scribe subclass for Wizard, and in this video I'm going to put that analysis together to show one possible optimized build for the subclass. Though, I've seen a few comments mentioning multi-class with Tempest Cleric to take advantage of switching damage types to lightning damage and then pushing around enemies like a bulldozer, so if you aren't aware, I've already done that build. It's called the Shock Chalk, and if that's the build you're interested in, click the link at the top of the screen. What I want to do today is show a more Order of Scribes focused build. This is a subclass that works great as a non-multi-class wizard, or a wizard with a single level dip for armor class. When I make a build decision, I'll do my best to cover the options and the benefits and costs of each of them. I want to start with the racial options, and I'll start by saying you can make a really good wizard build with any racial option in the game. So if you have a great concept for a Goliath wizard, don't draw the conclusion that because it's not a quote unquote best racial option, it can't be optimized and effective, the vast majority of our power comes from the wizard class itself and the Order of Scribes subclass itself. And the Goliath features, they're just fine. But there are races I do think are ideal picks. So here's some factors I consider when picking a race for Order of Scribes Wizard. Talked about this in the video analyzing Manifest Mind, but moving around our manifested mind is going to be eating up our bonus actions like Pac-Man eating dots. So races that have bonus action centered features are going to result in an overly bonus action hungry build. Otherwise races like Goblin or Shatter Kai for example would be tempting. Speaking of bonus actions that's also going to affect our spell selection. We don't want to overwhelm ourselves with spells that are eating up our bonus action every round because we aren't going to have it. I also consider size when I make a wizard because Dimension Door and Thunderstep, which are both fantastic go-to spells, I mean you don't need to have both of them, but you should have one of them, have this bit where if you want to teleport with an ally, they can't be larger than you. And I'll tell you, this comes up and it is frustrating when you play a small size wizard. If the Strixhaven spell Vortex Warp is available in your game, I especially recommend it for small size characters as it allows teleporting creatures bigger than you and it alleviates the inconvenience to some degree, but in general, I prefer a medium sized wizard. Speaking of Strixhaven, I'm not going to be using Strixhaven content in this build, but if it is available to you, by all means you should take Vortex Warp and you should take Silvery Barbs as well. Any flying race is always going to be a great option, that's pretty much universally true. Unlimited flight is pretty much always good, and the only real downside is restriction against medium and heavy armor. But you can do mage armor, a good dexterity. I mean, I would aim for a 16 dexterity and then put a shield on there and you're going to have a very respectable armor class. Of course, a multi-class dip is going to be needed for the shield proficiency and I guess it's debatable if that's really worth it. Good movement rates are also going to be a great option, even if it's just used for moving into cover that you otherwise couldn't have, or moving out of range while your manifested mind blows up the enemies. So Centaur and Tabaxi, they do stand out as good options as well. Herringon is always good for any wizard because winning initiative is just really nice. One thing that I learned when doing the tier ranking analysis is that I have been sleeping on the reborn lineage from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Now, if this source is unavailable to you, this build works just fine with the other races that I've already mentioned or any other race you like. But I've wanted to do a reborn build and this is an ideal opportunity. I'll mention that any elf race is going to duplicate one of the primary advantages here, so go ahead and pick any kind of elf and you're going to be able to benefit from one of the interactions that I'm going to be using with this build. Reborn is a lineage, so it's not a race per se, 
And the difference is that there are mechanics for turning your human, orc, or any other race into a lineage, though this is generally something that happens during gameplay, not character creation. And it's a DM option, not a player option, so I don't assume that we can just choose to play an Aarakocra that is also reborn. However, there are mechanics for choosing a lineage at character creation, so that's what I'm doing here. I mean, I'm not saying don't leave your comments on how an Aarakocra reborn would retain their fight speed. I find them very informative. So, the idea of a reborn is that your character has lived a past life, but death didn't end up being the end of the road. You aren't quite undead, you aren't the undead subtype, but let's just say you're undead adjacent. They provide several options as to how your reborn came to be that you can select or roll randomly if you prefer, or make up your own. When you choose reborn, you get the standard option to take three plus ones to ability scores or a plus two and a plus one and place them wherever you like. You get common and one other language of your choice. I'll be choosing primordial. I think it's useful for wizards to have, though we're going to have a lot of languages with this character. And our creature type is going to be humanoid and we can select medium or small size. I'll select medium for the reason I mentioned earlier and we will have a walking speed of 30 feet. And Ancestral Legacy says that if we choose this lineage at character creation, we gain proficiency in two skills of our choice. This is going to be helpful to make sure our character has an eclectic set of knowledge skills. Generally, my goal here is if the party needs a check of any intelligence-based skills, I'm going to be their guy. In fact, we may end up being better at intelligence-based skills than any other character is at any skill. The Rogue has a good stealth bonus, sure, but check out what my arcana is going to be once this video is over. We aren't just talking about the intelligence-based skills, we are going to jack them up, big time. I'll be choosing Investigation and Nature Proficiency with these selections. So Deathless Nature gives us a whole bunch of stuff, so let's go through it. We have Advantage on Saving Throws against Disease, that's pretty rare and being poisoned, which is less rare, and resistance to poison damage, and that's not rare at all. Poison resistance is really good on a wizard, as we have access to absorb elements, which gives us a lot of resistances, but not poison resistance, and protection from poison is in a wizard spell, meaning our defensive spell options for poison don't come until much higher level, so that's a great fit for this character. We have advantage on death saving throws. This isn't really a big deal because Ideally, we aren't making death saving throws all that often, but what this does do is reduce our chance of that potentially deadly natural 1 to a 1 in 400 chance when it's normally 1 in 20, and our chance of that natural 20 epic moment is up to almost 10%. We don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. I think the eating and drinking thing probably isn't going to come up, but the breathing thing probably will. That doesn't mean we don't want the water breathing ritual though, because first of all, our fellow party members probably do need to breathe. And secondly, a lot of DMs won't allow you to complete the verbal components of spells underwater without the ability to breathe water. Here's the big one though. We don't need to sleep and magic can't put us to sleep and we can finish a long rest in four hours. So this character needs time to copy as many spells as possible into their spell book. They will be doing it super fast, but with those four extra hours, we could copy an entire packed spellbook easily. I mean, we could copy 120 levels worth of spells in four hours. But also, and this is really neat, I think, check this out. According to the Dungeon Master's Guide, if you're crafting a magic item, the assumption is that each day of work requires eight hours. Once we get to 10th level in Scribe's Wizard, we can craft a scroll in half that time, which means those four hours could be used to craft a scroll with a crafting time of one day, which if we're using the Xanathar's scroll crafting rules means we could create a first level spell scroll while everyone else is just finishing their long rest. They don't have to wait for us at all. And if we want to create a scroll above first level or we're using the Dungeon Master's Guide times, those four hours will count as a day of work. So if we aren't copying spells, we can be crafting scrolls and constantly making progress without needing downtime really at all. Now earlier I mentioned that you could take an elf race as a possible substitute for reborn, and this is why. 
All elves get the trance feature, which includes this same four hour long rest mechanic. So if Reborn isn't available to you, just pick the elf you like and it works fine. If you are choosing a race that doesn't have this mechanic though, it's also fine. I mean, this interaction is nice, but it's not necessary for the build. And we finish up with knowledge from a past life, a real last but not least feature. When we make an ability check that uses a skill, and it doesn't matter if we're proficient or not, we can roll a d6 after rolling and add the number to our check. This is usable proficiency bonus times per long rest, and that's going to be easy enough to use. So I'm kind of thrilled that I've been wanting to make an optimized build for the Reborn lineage, and it just kind of fits this concept to a T. More skill proficiencies in the skills we want, bonuses on skill checks, four extra hours each long rest to copy spells and craft scrolls, and some extra goodies on top that work really well for Wizard. So that's our pick. Let's go on to ability scores. I'm going to be taking the plus two plus one option with the plus two in intelligence, of course, and the plus one in constitution with a point by that would be a 17 intelligence, 14 dexterity, 14 constitution, 13 wisdom, and I've dumped charisma and I've pumped up that strength to nine. Nine is really strong for a wizard, but carrying all those books, you know, it got me swole. I think for some of you, my multi-class decision should be pretty obvious, but I do want to discuss your options here. With any wizard, it's really tempting to take an armor dip. So you take one level in another class and you get proficiency in medium armor and shields, and that's going to give our wizard a solid armor class. If we choose a spellcasting class with the required armor proficiencies, we won't just get more spells, we'll also get full spell slot progression. So that leaves us with Cleric, Artificer, and Druid. Though with a Druid, the non-metal armor restriction should be considered, though check with your DM, a lot of them hand wave that whole rule. Actually, I should mention that someone suggested a Magic Missile, Fire Damage, Focus build idea using Scribe's Wizard. Here's the post from Ryan. There are three subclasses, Draconic, Wildfire, and Celestial, that add bonus to any Fire Damage spells. Since Scribes can cast Magic Missile with Fire Damage, do you see a build that focuses on Magic Missile able to complete with the Hex Foker? So the idea would be you take two levels in Scribes Wizard, then you pick up Magic Missile and a first level Wizard spell with fire damage, like Burning Hands, so you could switch the missiles to fire damage. Then you pick up six levels of Draconic Sorcerer, six levels of Wildfire Druid, and six levels of Celestial Warlock, and you would use your ability score increases to increase your charisma up to 20. So then you could cast Magic Missile and add a D8 with your Charisma twice to your damage roll. So extra 14.5, which because of the weird way Jeremy Crawford tells us to use Magic Missile where you're only supposed to roll one die and then you apply that damage result to every missile would mean that each missile would do 17 points of damage on average. So that's 51 fire damage with a first level slot and 17 more per additional spell slot level. Now, I could see doing this as a novelty build in a level 20 one-shot or something, but it's not a character build I would want to play in a campaign for sure, and it would take a long time to come together at all. And man, that build would suck against creatures immune to fire damage. It's really a one-trick pony. Also, it's not really a Scribes Wizard when only 10% of your levels comes from Scribes, but it was an interesting enough idea, I thought I would shout it out here. Thinking of these kinds of synergies with different multi-classes is a lot of fun. The build I'm presenting today doesn't rely on any of those kind of tricks. Artificer is kind of the go-to for wizard armor dips, and for good reason. You get constitution saving throw proficiency off the bat, which is ideal, though you might consider the resilient feat anyways at some point as you don't really want a weak wisdom saving throw, they can be a real Achilles heel. But you also don't have to worry about ability scores, since both the Wizard and the Artificer have Intelligence as their primary score. The disadvantage of Artificer is the requirement to be holding the Artificer spell focus whenever you cast an Artificer spell. For most Wizards, this is mainly just an inconvenience, you're constantly using your interaction to either pull it or put it away, but for Order of Scribes Wizard, it actually presents a bigger problem since the Order of Scribes Wizard also has a mechanic where they need to hold their spell focus, but it's not the same focus. 
Our spellbook is our focus, and only for our wizard spells. The interaction rules allow you for storing a focus or drawing a focus, but not for both. So there is a specific conflict here. Cleric doesn't give us the constitution saving throw proficiency, but otherwise it's just much more clean. And unlike a druid dip, we get the advantage of gaining our subclass as well as a subclass feature right at level one. Now, if you want the non-flavorful but most powerful option here, by all means, take a piece dip, you filthy min-maxer. But I think our concept is better served by the knowledge domain. So we're going to take religion and insight as our starting proficiencies. Religion is an intelligence-based skill, and insight isn't. But it's a useful skill, and we're going to have all the intelligence skills and more to spare. So we can definitely afford insight. With blessings of knowledge, we're going to learn two languages. I've taken abyssal and infernal. Like with Primordial, it might be useful for dealing with creatures we might summon or might encounter, and we get proficiency. In fact, double proficiency. So it's expertise. I don't know why they don't call it expertise, but that's what it is. So these will be our two best skills. Arcana and History are just the obvious choices, I think. So we are now proficient in every single intelligence-based skill, and we haven't gotten to our background yet. Now for spells, it's relevant that these spells use Wisdom as our spellcasting modifier, and for us, that's a plus one. So I wouldn't be taking Sacred Flame or anything like that. For Domain spells, we'll have Command, and again, I wouldn't count on our poor spell DC for the Command spell. But Identify starts our journey into Rituals, and it doesn't rely on our Wisdom. For Cantrips, I'm going to take Guidance, Light, we don't have Dark Vision by the way, so definitely Light, and spare the dying. None of these rely on wisdom. For first level spells, we'll only have two preparations. Now, keep in mind with Cleric, you can switch these out after long rest, but my go-to preps would be Bless and Healing Word. Bless is a top tier first level spell, probably our big play at level one, and Healing Word is one of those spells that technically relies on your casting ability score, but not in a way that really matters. If someone is at zero hit points and we have the spell slot, we can bring them back up and they'll go right back down again if they get hit again, just like they would be if we had a wisdom of 20. So for backgrounds, if you have the option to take campaign world specific background, nowadays most of them give you a free feat. Dragonlance backgrounds actually give you two free feats by level four and Ravnica backgrounds can increase our wizard spell list so if any of these are available, by all means, take those. If they aren't, then take something like Sage. That's what I've taken. We'll need to select different skills since we're already more than proficient in Arcana and History. So I'm going to grab Acrobatics and Perception. They're both useful skill proficiencies. And I have all the intelligence-based skills already. And we're down to the point where our language selections are, take what you want. Because we're into now common and five additional languages, you friggin' nerd. For equipment, I'm going to grab scale mail, a shield with an emblem spell focus on it, so no conflict with holding our spellbook later on, and a light crossbow because at level one, we might want to use that instead of wearing the shield since we don't have an attack cantrip. At level two, we'll start using the shield. And the first level tactics, pretty simple. We're an intelligence-based skill expert, and in combat, we cast Bless, and then we shoot stuff with the crossbow. Our armor class will be okay at 16. Not a super powerful first level character, but it's one level. You can see our list of skills, and all of them, not just intelligence skills, can be boosted by both a guidance cantrip and knowledge of a past life. So add a d4 as well as a d6 if needed. And that's like another plus six available on top of these modifiers. Okay, so time to become an Order of Scribes Wizard. So we're going to throw on two levels at a time here. We're going to start with two levels of wizard, but a third level character and a third level caster, which means we have a couple of second level slots. Arcane Recovery will give us half our wizard level and spell slot recovery after a short rest, once per long rest. So this is a scaling feature that will continually just give us more spell slots to cast spells with. One of the primary advantages of Wizard over other spellcasters is the Wizard doesn't just get ritual casting, but they don't even need to prepare their ritual spells. If the spell is in their book, they can cast it as a ritual. And as a Scribes Wizard, 
Well, we'll get into that later. The Wizardly Quill is a floating pen that supplies its own ink that we can erase, but the big point here is number two. We can copy a spell into our spellbook at an astounding two minutes per spell level. For other wizards, it's two hours per spell level. That's 60 times faster. And our Awakened Spellbook can be used as an Arcane Focus, and that's lucky because we have to hold it in order to use the Awaken Spellbook feature. Now, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole in this video to discuss material components and free hands for casting because these rules are a bit of a mess in 5th edition. What I will say is that our first feat is going to be Warcaster. So whether your DM is a stickler for the component rules or not, we're going to be okay. The second bullet, it's the big one, where we can switch damage types of our spells. I went into this in detail in the first video linked in the description, so I won't repeat myself here, but what this does mean is that we want spells in our spellbook that give us different damage type options, even if they aren't spells we would actually cast. Force damage, radiant damage, and piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing damage, those are the top tier damage types. And the third bullet is our ability to cast a ritual spell without adding the additional 10 minutes normally required to cast a ritual. So we could cast Detect Magic with an action, for example. No other wizard is going to be able to do that, because no wizard actually prepares the ritual spells. This isn't really going to affect my spell selection, as I generally want lots of rituals for any wizard. It's just a nice little enhancement. Finally, if you have a DM that likes to destroy or take away your spellbook, you do have a workaround with the Order of Scribes allowing you to replace your book. Though if you have that kind of DM, I am sorry. And if you are that kind of DM, stop it. So, we're into spell selection, and it's taken me a long time to do a Scribes build because, honestly, with a build video, I can't make assumptions for what spells you will have the opportunity to add to your spellbook beyond the given two additional spells per level, and an Order of Scribes wizard is desperately wanting to take advantage of that option for multiple reasons beyond other wizards both to fuel the feature that we just got where we can switch damage types and much later on for fueling our 14th level subclass feature. So I think I'll just give my general advice here. Copy as many spells as you can. If you have the gold and the spell to be copied, then there's not really a spell that you shouldn't copy into your spell book. I would certainly prioritize though within those restrictions. So if you have a limited gold, but you have all these spells to potentially copy, start by copying the spells you might actually cast first, then consider damage type switching, and finally, the spells that are just filler. But I'll just cover our standard spells with the build. We definitely want an attack cantrip, so we can put away our light crossbow and actually use our shield for a plus two armor class. So I'm gonna pick up Firebolt, also pick up Mind Sliver, and finally, I'll grab Minor Illusion. So Minor Illusion is a versatile little cantrip and one of the better cantrips in the game. I've devoted an entire video to it. So I guess I'll link that at the top of your screen. Then Firebolt is our top damage cantrip using an attack roll. It has a good range and it says we can target objects, which over time I've come to consider maybe the best rider of any attack cantrip. And Mind Sliver gives us a different damage type and targets a saving throw, Intelligence, which is, generally speaking, the best saving throw to target. And we get a nice rider here too, giving the targeted creature a penalty on their next saving throw. A first level wizard gets six spells in their spellbook of first level, and they get another two at level two. So that's eight first level spells to choose. So we're going to grab the go-tos for sure, which are Shield, Absorb Elements, and Find Familiar. I pretty much always take these three. It's also a good time to add in some offensive casting options. I mean, Bless is still a good casting option at this point, and it's probably what I would use my second level spell slots on. But Magic Missile gives us a decent, just straight, single target damage option with a good range or the ability to split up the damage if we want, and it's a reliable damage type. Long Strider is also a good option for upcasting. It's basically twice as good, cast with our second level slot, giving two creatures a 10 foot movement increase for an hour with no concentration. I find myself taking Long Strider pretty consistently when it's available. It's just a solid buff for the level with great upcasting. 
So that's five spells already. So I would grab ritual spells with the other three. Comprehend languages, detect magic, and unseen servant are all solid, and I'll have a regular casting time of one action, which we could use our awaken spell book to cast without the extra 10 minutes in a pinch. So at third level, we're now a proper scribes wizard. Adding our shield to armor class bumps it up to 18. That's a solid number. Of course, when half plate becomes available, grab it and bump it up to 19. Out of combat, we have an upcast long strider to buff party members with a long duration and no concentration. And in combat, an upcast bless is probably our biggest play, followed up by cantrips or a magic missile if we want a damage boost. Though I would recommend holding back a first level slot or two for when we might need an absorb elements or a shield spell. We really shouldn't need to switch damage types on spells much at this level. But if you do fight a creature that has a damage vulnerability, well then you can tap absorb elements to switch out your magic missile damage type for a number of damage type options. We can prepare all our non-ritual spells by the way. We even have one to spare. Maybe for a spell that we get to add to our spell book beyond this number, hopefully. So let's add two more levels. This is now a fifth level character, one cleric for a wizard, and we'll have third level spell slots, but no third level spells, at least for one more level. I've already mentioned that our ability score increase will be used to grab the Warcaster feat. This will take care of any issues casting spells with a shield in one hand and our spell book in the other. It also protects our concentration, which I think should be a priority for pretty much any devoted spellcaster. And we can cast spells at a target in place of making an opportunity attack against them, which I don't really see coming up with this particular character very often. We're adding one more cantrip. So I'm liking Mage Hand here. Mage Hand is basically a short range minor telekinesis cantrip. If you play D&D, I probably don't need to sell you on this pick. And I'm going to select four more spells. I'll take second level spells for all of these picks, but again, hopefully it's going to be more than four. But these would be my four selections if they didn't come up as opportunities for extra scribing. Web now becomes our biggest play in combat. This is another spell I've devoted a whole video to, so I guess I'll link that video up above as well. If you don't know why web is good, check that out. But I think the value of web is pretty common knowledge at this point. I would definitely grab Tasha's Mind Whip, probably as one of my picks when I achieved 5th level and got 3rd level spell slots, because it's not just a solid spell, it's a really solid upcast option for those slots. Like with Long Strider, it's basically twice as good when we cast it with a 1 level higher spell slot. Mind Whip has a lot going for it. It's a pretty solid debuff on an enemy with no concentration required. So you could mind whip a creature caught in your web spell and then that creature basically has no good options because if they use their action to free themselves from the web, then they won't be able to move out of it and they'll likely just get caught again on their next turn. Mind whip also removes reactions, which can be really useful and it does some damage. Not a lot, but it's one of those spells that does half damage even if the target makes their saving throw, which is intelligence again a good save to target. Now there's two kinds of characters. The first are characters who have a racial teleport option, and the second are characters that really want to have Misty Step. We're in that second camp. Easy pick. I also talked about how Misty Step combines really nicely with our 6th level scribes feature. That video is linked in the video description. So this is an even better spell for us as a scribes wizard. So to me this is a no-brainer pick. So our last pick is going to be Augury. When we prepare Web, Tasha's Mind Whip, and Misty Step, that is going to fill up our spell preparations. So this is a good opportunity to add another ritual which doesn't need a preparation. This is one of those divination rituals you only cast once per long rest because it starts to become unreliable after that. But basically, you ask the DM about a planned course of action and they'll give you a hint whether it's going to work out well or not. Nice little divination ritual. So at this level, with just our base picks, we only have one damaging second level spell, and that's Tasha's Mind Whip, which does psychic damage. And that's not a bad damage type, but we don't have any options for switching that damage type. Again, we want to be scribing spells whenever possible, so maybe we do have an option to switch it. 
Something like Cloud of Daggers would allow us to switch Tasha's Mind Whip to slashing damage, which is super reliable, for example. Dragon's Breath would give us several options. Even the absolutely rotten Dust Devil spell would give us Bludgeoning as a damage option. Speaking of bludgeoning damage, yeah, you could make a Scribe's build that focuses on delivering bludgeoning damage with spells, and then you could take the Crusher feat to add some force movement on those spells, which would be cool. And yes, I did consider that, but there's a couple issues here that are kind of insurmountable. The first is that Crusher force movement only works once per turn. That's a pretty big limitation, but the bigger issue is it requires an attack that delivers bludgeoning. And our spells are not going to be attacks, except for our cantrips, and we don't have any bludgeoning cantrips. And so, sure, we, we could take Chromatic Orb, and then, you know, you grab Catapult for first level casting, Dust Devil for second level casting, Erupting Earth for third, Eber's Black Tentacles for fourth, Big B's Hand can do bludgeoning damage with Grasping Hand, so that's fifth, Investiture of Wind for sixth, Whirlwind for seventh. There's more spell options for bludgeoning than that, but those are just some examples. So it wouldn't be hard to make a character that throws chromatic orbs and scorching rays and always does bludgeoning damage and then can use the crusher feet. I just don't think it's very optimal to be spending your spells on chromatic orb or a scorching ray for a once per turn five foot movement on top of needing an additional feat. But I thought the idea was at least worth mentioning. I mean, this kind of thing, it comes up a lot with Scribes Wizard. You can make a Scribes Wizard build that really leans into switching damage types. And if you do that, then you're looking for synergy to get the most out of those damage types. But with this build, I will mainly just be switching damage types for reliability. So at level five, we'll just have enough preparations to prepare all our non-ritual spells. And I think I've made the strategy clear enough. We're going to do Web as our big round one play, then Tasha's Mind Whip up cast to follow up if we're really ready to expend those big resources. And if we're in a situation where Web just isn't going to work, then Bless can be a backup. I should also mention that by level five, I think there's a pretty good chance we'll have half plate, so I've added that in. So we'll have a 19 armor class now, plus a shield spell option. And our proficiency bonus has gone up, which has double the impact on skills with expertise. So we've got a plus nine for Arcana and History. And again, we got the D4 Guidance Cantrip and the D6 Racial Feature to boost those even higher if we need to. And our other Intelligence-based skills are still solid at plus six. So let's move on to level seven. So level seven is huge for us. We now actually have third level spells, which are a significant jump from second level, but we also have our premier subclass feature, Manifest Mind. Check out the second video linked in the video description for my lengthy rundown of the many things we can do with this very potent feature. So I'm adding four spells. Again, add more than this, please. But at level six, level five in Wizard, level one in Cleric, the first two third level spells I'm adding are Slow and Lehman's Tiny Hut. So why Slow? Well, Hypnotic Pattern is fantastic. Fear is fantastic. Fireball is fantastic. And by all means, take those instead if you prefer. And I've taken those fairly consistently on various wizard builds. And there are a number of ways in which slow is worse. It debuffs enemies, but it doesn't shut them down completely. And they're getting an additional saving throw at the end of each of their turns to end the effect. Here's where slow is better, though. First, there's no friendly fire, and second, and most importantly, nobody is immune to slow. I think slow is often undervalued, but in my opinion, it is a really solid third level pick. And yeah, it doesn't shut down enemies completely, but it does make them a lot worse. Multi-attack options are gone, armor class is lowered, dexterity saving throws are made with disadvantage, reactions are gone, even if the creature had multiple reactions between turns, which more do now, and it can't do both an action and a bonus action on its turn, and if it's a spellcaster, that gets screwed up as well. So it's just a really solid debuff. But in all honesty, I largely wanted to give slow a highlight in general, and fireball does switch damage types, so that would be my other primary suggestion for this level. So in other words, if you like Fireball, take Fireball. 
and it's still a really good pick. At level 7, my next two picks are a Counterspell. I think you pretty much have to take and prepare Counterspell by 6 level in Wizard. And I'm also taking Phantom Steed. Have I done a video on Phantom Steed as well? Yes, I have. So, link up above. I will say that if you do take Fireball, I might choose a spell to give damage switching options instead of Phantom Steed. There's a number of options, but something like Erupting Earth is probably as good as any. Bludgeoning is super reliable, so you can call it Bludgeoning Ball. Very alliterative. Now, I should mention that none of the four spells I selected upcast. I mean, Counterspell technically upcast, but not normally. You're normally casting at third level. So our best upcast option for fourth level slots is still Tasha's Mind Whip. And there's nothing wrong with that. A fourth level Tasha's Mind Whip is three times as good as a second level Mind Whip. So our playing combat is now either web or slow. Here's how you decide. If you have non-flying enemies in tighter formation, web is probably the best play. Slow is going to be the best option if you suspect enemies might be immune to restrained, because a number are, you need to cover a bigger area. If the enemies are flying, if the enemies are spellcasters, or friendly fire is a consideration. Any one of those or multiples would be good reason to cast slow instead of web. Anyways, that's round one. Then on round two, it's largely like it was at fifth level, except now we're using fourth level spell slots for Tasha's Mind Whip, but a cantrip is fine if the fight is under control. If we lose concentration, you're going to need to cast web or slow again. Also, if your slowed opponents are saving and thus losing the slow effect, then you may need to reapply. And if you do, that's what you do. You reapply slow. Phantom Steed and Tiny Hut are both huge rituals that make a big difference in gameplay. Tiny Hut makes resting much safer, and Phantom Steed gives huge movement options, way more than the Longstrider spell, though it's also a lot easier to remove, so by all means do both for a character needing good mobility. And we're on to level 9, which is 8 levels in Wizard, 1 Cleric. And we've got to get our intelligence up. That 17 intelligence is holding us back on spell preparations, spell attacks, and spell save DCs. Because we have a 17 intelligence, that means we can afford a half feat here, and I did consider that, but instead, I'm increasing my intelligence by one and my constitution by one. Let me explain why. So the go-to intelligence half feats are generally either Fey Touched or Telekinetic. There's other ones, but those are the big two. Fey Touched gives us Misty Step, which we already have, but it is one free casting, which is okay, I guess. And a first level spell with a free casting. Maybe I would grab Command that actually uses intelligence or something like that, I guess but neither of those are huge benefits. Telekinetic is a solid half feat, but it's bonus action hungry, and Manifest Mind is bonus action hungry too, so it's not a great pick for an Order of Scribes wizard. And you know Resilient Constitution is gonna be coming on this build, so let's get some synergy where it is also gonna improve our ability score bonus, which is gonna pump up both our saving throw and give us more hit points. I will say, if you are playing in a campaign where you don't expect to get to level 13, then go ahead and take Fey Touched, I guess. We have three more preparations, thanks to that intelligence boost, and four spell selections, and now I'm looking at fourth level spells. There are many good options here. Arcane Eye is a nice spell. Banishment is solid, and a great upcast option. Confusion is a spell I've come to appreciate more the more times I've used it. Like Slow... Nobody is immune to confusion. Dimension Door is a spell I almost always take. Evers Block Tentacles is good and a nice upgrade to web. Autoluke's Resilient Sphere is a flexible, solid spell. Polymorph is probably the most well-known good 4th level spell pick, so I'm not going to take it. But you can if you like. Stone Shape is really good utility. If you just want to do more damage, get Summon Aberration and float the Beholderkin as far as you can from the action and get two decent single target blasts every round. And Wall of Fire is a nice damage switching option, and if you play in a group with characters that have force movement options, it is really solid. In fact, that's going to be my first pick. Wall of Fire does okay damage, but the key is to do the damage more than once. That's when it becomes good damage. 
because when we cast it, creatures in the wall make a saving throw and take half damage on a success. But if they take damage from the spell again, then there's no saving throw. They automatically take the full damage. So that's what we want, which is achieved by either having the enemy end their turn in the wall or on the side it's radiating heat, which we choose at the time of casting, or if they enter the wall on any turn. We're not a force movement character, but there's a very good chance that someone, maybe even multiple characters in our party, are. Whether it's the Repelling Blast Eldritch Blasters, or the Swarm Keeper Swarms, or Telekinetic Feet, or Grappling, whatever. These kinds of characters will really appreciate a wall of fire to throw enemies into. Really, there's only one downside. The damage type isn't super reliable, so that's our next pick. Now, we can't repair two additional spells at 8th level anyways, so this one is just for the spellbook and damage switching. So Evert's Black Tentacles is being taken as well. We can't prepare it, but it gives us the option of a bludgeoning damage wall of fire, which is pretty much a no-brainer. But if you are using this build and you are playing in a group where people don't use force movement, then I would take Summon Aberration instead at this level. Then at level 9, our intelligence modifier has gone up, so we can prepare both spells we pick. We also just got 5th level spell slots, so Banishment, I think, is the obvious first selection. Banishment, like Longstrider and Tasha's Mind Whip, is a great upcast option. Targeting two creatures who are just gone if they fail a Charisma saving throw, and Charisma isn't a bad save to target either. If the target isn't from the plane you banish them from, they're banished permanently after the minute is up, but most of the time that doesn't really matter. You drop concentration after all the other enemies are cleaned up and have the rest of the party ready actions to bonk them when they reappear. I don't remember the last time that a wizard drops concentration on banishment in order to have an enemy return after everything else is cleaned up and have that be really challenging. It tends to be just cleanup. And I'm also going to grab Dimension Door because, of course I am, Dimension Door allows you to bring along a passenger. I discussed the value of the Manifested Mind in Dimension Door in that second linked video, but I pretty much grab this spell with any wizard that reaches this level. So Wall of Fire, Banishment, and Dimension Door are added to spell preparations, and now Banishment, as well as Wall of Fire with Bludgeoning Damage, add to our big play options in combat. With both our Intelligence Modifier and Proficiency Bonus increasing at level 9, we now have a base plus 12 for Arcana in history, for context, a 20th level character with a 20 intelligence and normal skill proficiency would have plus 11. We have plus 8 in our other intelligence skills with the standard options to boost them. So onwards and upwards to 11th level, we have 10 wizard, 1 cleric. Master Scrivener was covered in that third link video, and the only thing I'll repeat here is that Tasha's Mind Whip is going to be my daily spell scroll. The scroll casts it at third level, so that's when we get two targets and it saves us a 3rd level slot on something we might have used a 3rd level slot on. As well, we can scribe scrolls faster and cheaper, and 1st level spell scrolls is the play here. If we're using Xanathar's, that's a scroll with just the 4 hours we saved on long resting. So for one thing, that does save us 1st level slots, but for another thing, it saves us spell preparations. So I'm not going to worry about preparing Long Strider or Magic Missile, I'm just going to craft scrolls instead. We don't need to upcast Long Strider if we can cast it several times. And we're not a Magic Missile centered build, so upcasting Magic Missile probably isn't the right play for us anyways. What that means is we will now have four available spell preparations as we select new spells. And that's some good timing. So we're adding a cantrip, and I think at this point we probably want to get Chill Touch. So Chill Touch is a ranged attack cantrip like Firebolt, but here's why we want it. If we hit a creature with it, it can't regain hit points until the start of our next turn. This is going to be more of a problem at higher levels. You start getting things like mythic creatures that really get screwed with chill touch, and this keeps us from needing to guess what damage type to do to stop regeneration, or creatures with big healing plays, and this keeps that from working. It's just a good cantrip to have for those situations. Now for the four selections. I'll just say that if your DM allows switching the damage type of animate objects, that is probably a pretty good play. I mean, you could grab animate objects and then maybe steel wind strike, and then you could have the animated objects do force damage. That'd be really good. 
I don't think it works though. I went through that in the first link video and I explained why I don't think it works, but I'm not here to tell your DM how they should run it. So if it is an option, I would consider that route. I'm starting with Synaptic Static. There's a few things I love about this spell, the big area, the damage, the intelligence saving throw, and it applies a debuff as well that is fairly impactful and doesn't require your concentration to maintain, and it can last a long time. Solid non-concentration 5th level spell option. And I'm also taking Transmute Rock because it's also non-concentration and can really pair well with Wall of Fire. This is a great battlefield control spell, and not needing concentration? Come on. Oh, and also notice you can transmute the ceiling and it drops and it does a bit of bludgeoning damage and I'm not recommending that, but I'm pointing out that there is no reason to have our synaptic static deliver psychic damage when bludgeoning is available. So I'd be doing synaptic static bludgeoning damage because of transmute rock. Then wall of force because we're a wizard and wizards need to take wall of force. And finally, pass wall because this is a great utility spell and we're not always in combat and we wanna be a Swiss army knife of useful tools and tricks outside of combat as well. Rituals help us with that, but some of these spells can help us as well. You can bypass all kinds of challenges and difficulties with Passwall. This is another spell I've grown more fond of recently because I guess I run these one shots all the time with patrons and I don't think about Passwall when I'm designing the adventures, but then someone in the party will have it and they're able to trivialize things I expected to be really difficult. And so I'm kind of sold on Passwall. And so we're preparing all four of these. And now not only do we have a number of big plays on round one, but now we actually have a number of really big plays on round two. Well, we're concentrating on a round one spell. We can follow it up with a transmute rock or a synaptic static for a huge one, two punch. So onwards and upwards, level 13, so we're 12 wizard, one cleric. And resilient constitution, of course. Concentration is now protected much better. A plus eight constitution saving throw with advantage if it's a concentration save due to damage. Technically, there's a chance of failing a DC 10 concentration save, but it's one in 400, and it is gonna be 0% eventually. It's also another 13 hit points, which is nothing to sneeze at. So we will have two additional spell preparations and four more spells. I am starting with contingency because wizards take contingency at level 11. We have Dimension Door, which is a great contingency option. I mean, potentially, because I have heard that apparently some DMs won't let you pick the direction of your Dimension Door when it goes off through contingency. So if you have one of those DMs, then you probably want something else. So I guess if you can inscribe Autoluke's Resilient Sphere into your spellbook, that would be another option. Personally, I allow the player to pick the direction of Dimension Door when it goes off. But if you're not sure, check with your DM. A nice thing about Contingency is when we're adventuring, we don't need to prepare it because after it's cast, it lasts for 10 days. So we just prepare it when we cast it and then we prepare something else. So I would do Dimension Door if... Maybe if I fall to 20 hit points, or maybe when I say the magic word, or blink twice rapidly, something like that. And yeah, mass suggestion because you kind of got to, right? It's unfortunate there are these spells that are just too good to pass up, so you end up taking them every damn time. But that's the game we have, and I am not skipping mass suggestion, which will be my usual preparation at level 12. Then at level 13, I'm going to grab Rary's Telepathic Bond because it's a good ritual and I only get one more spell preparation. And I'm also going to take Wall of Ice because when you get to high levels, half the friggin' creatures have bonus action teleports, but they all need to see the destination. So let's get an opaque wall option. They can just bust through the wall and then move through it, but it's going to take time and it's going to deal some damage. So it's all good. If we pick up some more 6-level spells, this is a good candidate for damage swapping as well. And our proficiency bonus has gone up again, so we have plus 9 or plus 14 on intelligence skills with all the stuff. On to 15th level, so 14 wizard, 1 cleric. We now have our final order scribes feature, one with the word. And 
Ideally, our spellbook is way bigger than just the selections I've made in this video, in which case, this is a reaction once per long rest that negates all damage and the cost is basically negligible. Also, we get advantage on Arcana checks, so that is going to be a plus 14 with advantage now. So start expecting 30 plus results, especially once we start adding guidance and our racial features. So here's the first time that we can just end this campaign if we're not having fun. Just take Simulacrum and you can break D&D. Congratulations, you just won. I mean, it would be a lot classier to quit the campaign so the rest of your group can still enjoy themselves, but if you want to be a prick, you can use Simulacrum and wreck it for everyone, which is why I never recommend this spell anymore. Speaking of which, I believe there was a comment on my Manifest Mind video saying that with Simulacrum, you could have two Manifested Minds operating at the same time. And I have to say, well done, commenter. You just found the one way that Simulacrum could be abused. My first pick is Teleport because I only get one more spell preparation, but I don't necessarily need to prepare Teleport. It's that Swiss Army knife outside of combat and all that jazz. But if we do need it, we will need to take a long rest. And Force Cage. Like Mass Suggestion, you just kind of got to. And got to prepare it as well. With my 12th level wizard selections, Reverse Gravity is a nice battlefield control option. And Etherealness, which we can't keep prepared, but we can keep it in our back pocket. Swiss Army Knife and all that jazz. And rather than go through level 16 to 20, of course, we would grab Maze and Wish, probably True Polymorph and Prismatic Wall. But as far as Order of Scribes goes, this is all the features here at level 15. And at level 16 in Wizard, I would be tempted to grab the Alert feat and then maybe pump my Intelligence to 20 at level 19. There, that's the 20th level character if you are playing this character to level 20. So this build is not a trick build. Yes, I will be switching damage types and engaging in Manifest Minds shenanigans and crapping out spell scrolls and ignoring damage, and I am the Intelligence Skill Monkey. But for the most part, this is the Wizard's Wizard. With the Cleric Dip, we only set back our Wizard spells slightly, and we took spells that use those higher level slots well. The Saving Throws are good, the Armor Class is good, the Hit Points are good, we have an eclectic set of spells. We have battlefield control, damage, debuffs, utility, concentration, and non-concentration, effective spells, targeting a variety of saving throws when a saving throw is even granted. Now, the one thing this particular build isn't going to be good at is single target damage. We've got some cantrips. We've got magic missile. Uh, but beyond that, it's all like area of effect damage or non-damage. And if that is something that you wanted on this character, then I would suggest getting and preparing Summon Aberration. That will really boost that particular niche. Usually with my wizards, I don't really worry about it because there's always going to be other people who do the single target damage, and my job is the crowd control. So, at long last, I am done with the build for the nerdiest wizard there ever was. Would you build it differently? Let us know in the comments. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. I want to thank some of the patrons that allow me to continue this kind of content on this channel. If you would be willing to support my work here, please click the Patreon link in the video description. Today, I want to thank Hey Mr. Wonderful, Babrak, Blue Wolf, John D., Discarpus9, El Conquistadorito, Jared Huberger, John Wayne, Joseph Hall, Joseph Robido, Joseph Rogers, Wu Carl Kong, Lila Corpsegrave, Michael Michelle, Moxie, Nemo, Paul Suzak, Promethio NTG, Purge Thunder, Reichenstahl, Rico, Ryan Wilmot, Shane and Todd Beyond, Starfall, Stephen Mellin, Earshine, Third, and Wade. And thanks to all my patrons.